Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us in our third session on the doctrine of uh, systematic theology. We are looking at the doctrine of man today and man's creation. Uh, next time, we'll be looking at the fall of man. But let's jump right into our study for today. The doctrine of man's creation. We're going to talk a little bit about the characteristics of man's creation. Uh, first of all, it was something that was planned by God. It's not something that was inherently due to evolution, although some scientists would say and some philosophers would say that man is here as a product of blind chance and evolution. Uh, the biblical view is that God created man. In Genesis chapter 2, we see in verse 7, uh, that the Lord God formed man from the dust of the ground, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and that man became a living being or soul. He is also created in the image and likeness of God. Uh, we see this, for example, over in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26, where God says, Let us make man in our image and in our likeness so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds of the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So both man and woman are created in the image and likeness of God. So what does it mean? to be created in God's image and in His likeness. Uh, the word image in the Hebrew is uh, salem, and the word for likeness in the Hebrew is demut. One of the things that we notice about that is that these are two words that fundamentally mean the same thing, much like in Romans where Paul talks about uh, that man suppresses the truth in his ungodliness and, and the unrighteousness. Both ungodliness and unrighteousness are synonymous terms. Uh, John MacArthur notes, in reference to being created in the image of God and the likeness of God, means that uh, he is like God in some ways and that he represents God on the earth. Man is both a king and a son. Yet at the same time, he is not God. Humanity is placed into three relationships. And this is really where the idea of image and likeness comes to bear. Uh, man can have a relationship with God. Man can have a relationship with other people and humans. And man can have a relationship with the creation. And so as God's image bearer, MacArthur notes, man is constituted to relate all three effectively. Each human person is also a complex unity uh, of body and soul uh, or spirit, that is the immaterial aspect of man. And so as a volitional and reasonable being, man is called to love God and to show his allegiance by obeying God. Dr. Ryrie, in his book on systematic theology, uh, gives also a definition of the image and likeness of God, and he says it this way, to sum up the image of God in which man was created include the totality of his being as living, intelligent, determining, and moral. Uh, that is, that man can have fellowship with God. Uh, that's unlike any of the other creatures that God created. So in that sense, there are some facets of man that is very similar to God. For example, man can be moral. Um, you look around at the animal kingdom, uh, the animal kingdom is not guided by morality. It's guided by instinct and survival mechanisms. Uh, man, on the other hand, is commanded to be and live a moral life. Why? Because he's morally accountable to God. And so man is a moral creature. He's also a spiritual creature. Man not only has a physical body, but he also has an immaterial spirit. Uh, man is a bipartite creature. Therefore, man can act in ways that are significant 
in the immaterial spiritual realm of his existence. Man also has certain mental capacities that he shares, uh, albeit at a creaturely level, with God. He has the ability and the capacity to act rational, to reason, to think logically, and to learn that sets apart the human creature from all of God's other animals that he created. So in that sense, man is similar to God. He's also similar to God relationally. That is, the depth of interpersonal harmony experienced in human relationships is much greater than the interpersonal harmony that animals experience. Again, much of what they uh, are driven by is instinct and the desire or will to survive. We also share some sense, uh, even though God is spirit, the scriptures tell us that uh, God sees. We also, with our physical bodies, have the capacity to see. Uh, the Bible tells us that God hears. We also have the capacity to hear. Uh, and that God speaks, and we also have that capacity to speak. So in that sense, man is very uh, similar to God. Thus, the image and likeness of God in man has more to do with his function than it does with his form. It has to do with his function more than it has to deal with his form. Now let's consider how transmission of man's being is passed on. There are two biblical views for this, and, and I realize that some of you, this might be the first time you're hearing these terms, and it was a question that I posed to you uh, on the Expositor's page website, uh, and it deals with the origin of the soul. There are two biblical views, as I said, the first And what this view says is that at the moment of conception, uh, based upon the normal procreation process in uh, human beings, that God creates a soul and then he unites the soul with the physical body of the embryo. Some of the evidences for this kind of uh, transaction is that the body is a entity that is created by the parents through sexual union. God then creates by fiat, that is, he creates something out of nothing instantaneously, and then he joins that soul with the material body. Since the nature of the soul is immaterial, that is, it cannot be seen, can't be experienced but through empirical observation and so on, uh, it cannot be uh, the creationists would say, it cannot be transmitted uh, through natural uh, generation, meaning the parents couldn't create it. Uh, and then the third strongest evidence for the creationist view of the soul is that it, it, it best explains why Jesus Christ had a sinless nature. Uh, this could only be true, they would say, if his soul were created and then joined in a physical body uh, and this way, he would avoid having a sinful nature. And so that's one of the strongest evidences, biblically speaking, that would answer the question in reference to the creation of the soul. Now, that's the first view. The second view, biblical view, is the term traducianism. Traducianism. And what this view says is that at the moment of human conception, that both the material body as well as the immaterial soul, are transmitted from the parents to the offspring. Some of the uh, best evidences for holding this particular view is that, first, uh, after God rested on the Sabbath, after creation, the scripture says that he, he ceased, that is, there was no more fiat or creation ex nihilo, that is, something out of nothing. For example, in Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, Moses, who writes the book of Genesis, says, Thus the heavens and the earth were completed, and all their host. By the seventh day God completed his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh, seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day and sanctified it, that is, he set it apart, because in it he rested from all his work, uh, technically he, he ceased from all of his creation, in which he had created and made. 
So if that's the case, God's not creating fiat by means of fiat, something immediate and then uh, joining it, such as the soul, with the human body. That would be one illustration or application of this particular verse. Another evidence for this would be in Hebrews chapter 7, verse 10. The writer to the Hebrews is using an illustration, if you will, to demonstrate the superiority of the Melchizedekian priesthood over the Arianic priesthood. And what he says is this, that when Abraham paid a tithe to Melchizedek, in essence, Levi, uh, who was a priest, uh, paid a tithe to Melchizedek, thus demonstrating that the lesser priesthood paid a tithe or paid homage to the greater priesthood. So in Hebrews 7, 9, uh, the writer says, And so to speak, through Abraham, even Levi, though he had not existed and will not exist for many, many years, Levi, who received tithes as a priest under the Mosaic Covenant, he paid tithes, for he was still in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So scripture already assumes then the full existence, both that which is immaterial and material, already being uh, in existence in the person of Levi. There's no mention here about it was just his material body that was present, but rather the whole person. And then finally, uh, one of the strongest arguments for the case for traducianist view of the soul is that creationism uh, has God creating souls. In the creationist view, God creates the soul and then joins it with the human body. And in this case, since man is a fallen creature, God is taking something that is pure and he is joining it with something that is fallen. Thus, God is in engaging in creating a fallen creature. So the third evidence is really a strong critique against the creationist view. Now, there have been many good theologians through the uh, history of the church that have held to both views. Uh, I, as well as uh, Dr. Ryrie, who writes the uh, basic theology book that we use in our course, as well as many other theologians, hold to the traducianist view. J. Oliver Buswell, in his systematic theology, writes, quote, As between these two views, that is, creationism and traducianism, uh, it does seem to me that there is a certain obvious fact which has been neglected in the historical discussion, and that it is the perfect uniformity and regularity of the arrival of a soul whenever a human being begins to be. We usually ascribe the result to the secondary forces by which God has created and which he maintains by his divine providence. And so what he's saying there is that, that God is using secondary causes, that is, the normal uh, procreation process, through and by which uh, a new person, that is, both the material and immaterial, are formed. Uh, Buswell goes on to say, for this reason and for this reason only. I am inclined toward the Traducian view, but I do not feel that it can be firmly established on the grounds of any explicit scriptural teaching. I, I agree with him to a, a certain degree. I do think, however, that there is uh, a strong indicator or an indication that the Traducian view is something that is supported uh, in Scripture. For example, and we read it a while ago, uh, God created man in his image and likeness. Now, we know that in Genesis 3, Adam and Eve fell into a state of sin. Uh, fundamentally, God unplugged them. They became spiritually dead. And what do sinners have? Well, according to their nature, uh, you know, cats have cats, dogs have dogs, sinners have sinners. And over in Genesis chapter 5, Moses writes this in verses 1 through 3. He says, this is the book of the generations of Adam. In the day when God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female, and he blessed them and named them man. That is man in a generic sense. In the day when they were created. And when Adam lived 130 years, he became the father of a son. Watch this. In his own likeness, according to his image. According to his image. That is, according to a fallen image image. So what we see here is 
uh, you know, there's nothing morally evil about the material body, but in his fallen image and likeness, both the soul and the body here are included because he's talking about the whole person that is his son, that is Seth. And so Seth was born after the image and likeness of his father. It doesn't state that God created Seth. That is, it doesn't state that God created Seth's soul and then joined it with his body. Dr. Tony Evans, in his theology book, puts it this way. He said, The reason is that Adam was acting as the covenantal representative of the human race. That is, when he was charged with sin. Adam was given a position of headship by God, so his sin affected all who would come after him, to include Seth, to include me, to include you. That's why Paul said, sin passed to every person through Adam. And because Adam is our father, and because Adam's nature was changed when he sinned, uh, therefore when any offspring that he produces to include the whole person, that is both the material and the immaterial, again, man as a bipartite creature, uh, that is going to be affected by the consequences of sin. So that's two views. Again, I realize that some of you, this may be the first time you're uh, hearing about these views. That's fine. That's really all I want to do is introduce them to you as we go through this brief study on man's creation. Now, let's consider this soul, uh, this immaterial aspect of man. In addition to uh, man being both material and immaterial, there is also a debate in reference to the immaterial facet of man's nature, that is, in reference to his soul, if you will. There are two views on this. Uh, the first view is called the dichotomist view that uh, espouses man as a dichotomy. Man is a two-part being. Uh, he consists of both the material, that is his body, and the immaterial, which is the soul. The non-material part of man is his soul and his spirit, which are of the same substance, which are of the same substance. So man is, again, a bipartite creature. Uh, the other view in reference to uh, man's part is the trichotomous view. Hence, man, they would say, in the trichotomous view, is a three-part being. Not a bipartite, but a tripartite being. He consists of body, the material body. He consists of soul, uh, the, an immaterial facet of man. And he also consists of spirit. So the body and this particular view, is seen as world-conscious, the soul as seen as self-conscious, and the spirit is seen as having God-consciousness. The soul is seen as the lower power consisting of man's imagination, his memory, his understanding, his volition, and so forth. The spirit, which is again another facet of his immaterial being, is viewed as the higher power, consisting of reason, conscience, and so forth. So the trichotomous view divides the immaterial facet of man uh, in reference to his soul into various parts. Uh, now, there's a little bit of evidence for this that we find in Scripture. Sometimes uh, Paul will use the term soul and spirit, and so there is evidence to demonstrate that. So the question would be for us, well, then how do we deal with that? So is man uh, a bipartite, two-part being, or is he a tripartite being consisting of body, soul, and spirit? Uh, here, I, I like the way that Dr. Ryrie answers this dilemma, if you will, when he basically says it this way, and this would be the view that I would hold, that man is made up of fundamentally two substances. And instead of calling it body, soul, and spirit, it's best to call it or classify it according to what it really is, that which is material, such as the body, and then that which is immaterial, which would include, watch this, uh, the soul, the spirit, 
the mind, the heart, all of these descriptions that in the Bible are discussed as an immaterial facet of man. So it's best to see man's facets much like the different facets on a diamond. We know that when we take a diamond and stick it under a light and you begin to turn the diamond, that the light is reflect, reflected off of the various angles of the diamond. And that's the best way to really understand the immaterial aspect of man, which consists of his heart, mind, soul, will, intellect, and so forth. We could classify all of that under the heading of immaterial. So Ari goes on to say this. He says, The many facets of the material and the many facets of the immaterial join together to make up the whole of each person. Man is rich diversity in unity. So what have we talked about today? We've talked briefly about the creation of man, that man is not here as a product of evolution that man is here because God purposed him to exist, uh, that God created man. Uh, it wasn't something that was done over time. God created Adam and Eve. Uh, he formed dust from the ground. He breathed into Adam the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Uh, it's interesting to note that when God did create Adam, he created him with the appearance of age. That is, Adam was created as a mature human being, a man, a male, who was uh, capable of procreation. He didn't create him as a child and watch Adam grow up and so forth. Uh, Adam was already created as an adult, and so was Eve. So man is here by a miracle, God's miracle. God created him. So in addition to man being created by God, Man is also a bipartite creature. That is, he is material and he is immaterial. We also discussed briefly uh, the two views in reference to the origin of the soul. The first being the creationist view, which is the view that God creates the soul and he places it or joins it at the moment of conception with the material uh, offspring of a sexual union between the parents. Uh, which is, the again, the creationist view. And then the other view that we talked about is the traducianist view. And we said that this is the view that both the material and the immaterial uh, are passed on from parents to children. And one of the strongest evidences we saw for that, uh, biblically speaking, there's two. Uh, one would be in Genesis chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, that Adam had a offspring, Seth, in his own image and likeness. Not that Seth was created in the image and likeness of God, but that he was taken after the image and likeness of his father, a fallen nature, that is, a fallen man in Adam. And then the second example we looked at, uh, in reference to the traducianist view, or support for the traducianist view, was over in Hebrews chapter 7, when Levi... Uh, in the argument that the writer is using, is already pictured as a full whole person in the loins of Abraham, that is, both his material and his immaterial. Uh, in other words, it, a material body, apart from the soul, can't pay a tithe. It, that takes volition, reason, planning, and so forth. So that whole person that is inside the loins of Abraham at the time uh, is viewed as having all of those capacities that would only be the case if the immaterial aspect of Levi were already seen as having joined that material body. What are we to make out of all of this? What are we to conclude? That man is a unique creature. He is able to enjoy fellowship with God. However, after his sin... And after sin entered into the picture, man's relationship with God changed. Virtually, and you've heard me say it many times, God unplugged man. He's in a state of spiritual death and at enmity with God. In our next session, we'll see how God, the steps that he took to change that situation, 
as the second person of the Godhead will come into humanity to redeem lost man. We look forward to seeing you in our next session.